Come on by and have a bite at the Crossroad Diner, the place where your spirit goes when it might be time to change direction. Hey everybody, Steve McCurdy. Welcome back to the Crossroad Diner with me today. In fact, I'm in his office. I'm, I'm in Ed Barr's office. This is my friend Ed hey, Barr. Glad to have you. Glad, well, glad to be had. Glad to be had. Um, we um, we have been friends for uh, we've known each other for about three years, but we became friends about a year ago. Uh, Ed is a, a musician. Uh, he's also uh, a composer and, and a writer. Um, tell, tell me how you got interested in, in music. When did that begin for you? Gosh, it's, it's uh, I'd have to say it's family. My mother's mother was a degreed musician. She was born in um, 18, around 1885, went to Indiana University, actually got a degree around 1900, was a music teacher. Some of my earliest recollections were uh, watching her play piano as a child on the floor. I was fascinated by the pedal. I was fascinated. I can still I can still see that her black shoes working those pedals. I thought, what in the world? That was more fascinating to me than the music. But she was really a fine musician. And then her daughter, my mother, also had a degree in music and. I, I I grew up with a lot of music in the home. My, my dad. And when I was a few months old, was called by Uncle Sam to Asia to fight people he didn't even know. And um, <laughs> he suddenly had to leave, and he left mother with uh, Philip about two, and I was about a half at the time. So nice. he, he was going to Japan to fight and uh, the war, and mother, I think, dealt with that by playing piano. I remember her singing. I don't see how mother could sing when suddenly her husband's off fighting in a world war, and she's got two babies and trying to take care of her husband's business. I, I can't imagine. I, 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 I can't imagine. But she, I think, to survive, she would sing a lot. She would play the piano, and we. she had 78 records. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was once again I was more fascinated I think by how did the mechanics of yeah how did that sound come out of those I remember asking my mother now this I, this was pre five years old because um, I know where we're living at the time and I was I would ask my mother how does that what is that that makes the sound in there so I just heard uh, I heard music and then we all played in the band I started. Um, I started trumpet at about age six, and we had the, the local music man was an Italian, a former Italian professional circus band director, and his name was Gene Sturcio, and I was scared to death of him. He was very, he was strict and firm. I couldn't understand him when he would, <laughs> I was 10 years old and playing with these what I thought were adults, the high school kids. But in those days, everybody played in the band. I mean, if they, he was the town band director. So if you were, if you had an instrument, and in those days you had to buy the instrument from him, and you had to buy the music from him, but you turned it in at the end of the year. After you <laughs> heard, so we rented the music from him. But anyway, he was a great cornet player. had been a circus, circus man director and um, took, took lessons from him. And then I played... I was nine years old and played. This is an important. I'm, I'm glad you asked me that. I like to recall this. I'm nine <laughs> years old, and we had assembly programs in those years in the 50s. And the principal asked me to play a trumpet solo at age nine. Well, I was a little bit, my mother, of course, was accompanying me. And I played, um, I remember it. I remember holding my, I remember where I, now we're talking a long time ago. I was nine years old. You know, um, just give me land, lots of land under the starry skies above. Don't fence me. I can still feel it. I can feel, feel that play in that. Well, I don't know how it sounded. Terrible, probably. But when I got back into my classroom, I felt different. Mm -hmm. I was, hey, there, you know, yeah. another what he played that, what's that thing he was playing? I was standing up on a stage playing to my classmates and peers, some younger, some older, because this was a one through five, and I was right in the middle. But that was a big deal. That was oh, yeah. that was big for me, and it still, it still uh, 
clearly etched in my memory. That, right. that was my first public performance, and I got a um, I got a taste of that stage. Yeah. And um, like you as an actor, you know, there's something about exp expressing yourself in music. Well, it's the connection. You know, you you didn't have a connection with those people. That you, you had a little connection, but it was school. <laughs> But then it changed. It and, changed. And it had a different After aspect. 32 measures, it changed. <laughs> <laughs> I no longer was just a guy over there, a third grader. I could do something, and I think I, I, I think it's Well, since, since music was such an in, integral part of the household and people were doing other things, when did it occur, it occur to you that that was a career that you might I, I, I clearly know that. I, I, I liked a lot. I was interested in a lot of things. I had, uh, I like, I was, I wanted to be a veterinarian at one time. I wanted to be an architect, but you, you know, you gotta, you gotta divide and subtract and add to be an architect. I learned, no, don't try that. <laughs> and, um, we had a family friend who was a veterinarian and I've always loved how to have Mickey a dog is like age three so I've always loved dogs and cats but that kind of went by the wayside in high school I like I kind of idolized my band director I, I just really looked up to him and I that also is, is another part of a story about when I became a band director I remember what I thought about my band director and it 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 made me a better band director Right. Knowing how kids view. Uh, and he actually would take me on gigs, which probably was not a good thing to be going as a 15-year-old out with about six guys my parents' age. Mm. Um, but got in the band, and um, I liked his lifestyle. My dad had a business. I would see my dad come home at 5 o'clock. And I knew he was worried about his business. I knew he was. Yeah. And he had a wife and four kids, and he had a successful business, but he worried about it. Right. When my band director went home, I don't think he worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, get me a beer. And I mean, that was the big that, that was the big challenge. <laughs> that was the where that was is what the he beer? Was, where is it? So, and in those days, one school, one band director, he would teach a couple of hours at the high school, and then he would get in his Volkswagen. And drive to a couple of elementary schools. Well, I like I like that mobility because I saw my dad captured yeah. from eight thirty till five every day, and I'm in terribly. I'm what was his business? Jewelry business. So it was a jewelry, Phil, yeah. Philip followed his. Physical. Yeah, he was a very good amateur musician. Good uh, played. We we've had family music every night. Uh, we'd get through dinner. Mother would play piano, he would play violin. Philip Philip was actually a I tell people Philip had more talent, natural talent than I did. I worked harder than he did, but he was a very talented singer, clarinet player, cellist. Philip is um, is his younger older oh, brother. Older, 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 his Stephen, older brother. Tommy and Stephen both. So we had a we had a, a full family orchestra. But anyway, back to seeing that mobility. Yeah. And my impatience and nervous, I, I don't like to sit and, and be in one place all day. And I thought, you know, he gets to direct a band. What's more fun than playing music and directing a band and listening to music all day? That's why we call it play. It's not work. We don't go to work every day. We go to play every day. And the fact that he was free to go, well, by free, I mean, he had to drive, but that represented getting some movement. Changing locations. Yeah, changing yeah. locations and and moving around. And I, I, I observed that for four years and watched him, and I said, you know, that, that fits. I love to work with people. I like people. Sure. I love music. I love to be able to, whatever I can do, I love to help somebody else. And I've had, I've had students that uh, perform much better than I did, and I still work with them and enjoyed it. Uh, the relationship between music teachers and music students is different than the relationship between professors and and, and students. No question about it. Uh, there's an no. intimacy or something that it's talk, similar. Talk to me about well, that. well, we first off, we recruit math teachers don't recruit their math students. Right. Um, they get them a major maybe when they're in their third year. So they have their core courses a couple of years, and they get the major courses this junior and senior year. We know our students many times when they're in high school. I've known sophomores that I started working on. One of the best students I ever had, I actually heard perform as a sophomore, and I said, I'm going to, I'm going to recruit that 
young man if I lost, and I did. And he's a very, very successful band director today. But then we get them day one, and we have them the last day. So there's uh, that's different than any other discipline, except athletics is athletics. somewhat that way. Coaches know who those well, but there can. there is no team activity that's more team than an orchestra. Everybody's got to do their part. You can't really have a substitution. Absolutely. You can't ad lib. You got to yeah, you got to follow the instruction. I, I tell so many people, and it, it sounds like I'm trying to be funny that life is better for people who went through a band program. Band is a wonderful experience. And kiddingly, I've probably told you this, when when my wife and I, who was not at the band, if we ever have to make a decision or a problem or we bump heads about something, I'm thinking, now if she had been in the band, we wouldn't be having these problems. <laughs> we wouldn't be having these problems. <laughs> Honey, why didn't you play in the band? We we wouldn't have this problem now. But well, but that, anyway. But that's the you know, you bring up an interesting point because the Crossroad Diner is about what do you do when you come to that place where you got to make a choice? Uh, you know, you've got to figure out what you're going to do. And, and how did that evolve for you? Because you you had a conviction. You were going to be a musician. You were going to study music. Did you know you were going to be a band director? What did you think you were going to do? In high school, I was thinking, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be like my high school band director. I wanted a band. Now, when I got in um, early in the college, I got to thinking, you know, it would be fun to perform music and play music and I thought for a long time this would have been early 60s I thought I actually could make a living having an orchestra right I thought I could be an orchestra I'm I'm not talking about a, a pipe dream I thought I could have an orchestra and then I saw the reality of that and things were changing so much music in the in the 60s just huge changes. Right. Every decade has changed, but we certainly experienced. Well, if you look at the, you know, I listened to the recordings from the 50s, and, you know, Perry Como had the same band playing behind him that Dean Martin did. You know, they, they were studio musicians. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and they were big bands, and they were, there, but you you didn't have, but when, then we turned the corner, we have four four man groups you know, playing and singing and, and, uh, and a whole different kind of music. It's just a real... And Steve, another about the, you made me think about this, the orchestra. And when I was a child, we listened, I listened to the same music on the radio my parents did. We didn't... That, right. I used to teach my students in a popular music class. I was alive. I saw all this rock and roll change. I saw the social changes and I heard the music. And I remember very, very well how my mother was hesitant about us watching Elvis Presley, that first famous Ed Sullivan appearance. Right. We talked about that. Now, I mean, I was a junior high school student with that. But it, when we when we were in the family car as a family listening to the radio, it was the same. There was not a kid station and an adult station. There was radio. Right. Then suddenly we got a little small, I got independent, but we got a small radio station here and they were spinning those 45s and playing um um you know buddy holly and the crickets and we loved that music and and my mother i remember seeing the concern now kids couldn't understand this day i remember seeing the concern in her face you like that what, well, how do you explain what are they doing what are they saying i remember turning a corner one morning taking us to school and a and a kind of a pop tune came on and she just she couldn't relate to it she, yeah. she that was just it was well and at that point in time we had the fracturing and you said had radio stations that then decided what their format was that they weren't just a radio station they were a top 40 station they were a talk station they were a holy station they were a, a big band station um that that happened it, it there was a point in time in the late 50s that that took place. So since the show is about decisions and crossroads, um, what did, what was the one that you had to face where you, you, you went to college here and you got a degree in music. Where was your first job? My first job was in Folkestone, Georgia, Charlton County high school. And a, a friend told me, and I went that summer still thinking, uh, I was taking some courses at Florida State because 
about us, it was a very small department. We didn't have what's called methods courses. I right. knew by then I wanted to be a band director. So I, I was taking actually on the graduate level, but I was covering courses that I knew I had to have. I knew I had to have woodwind experience and percussion experience. And I was a brass player at the time. And um, someone told me there was a job open. And this was late in the summer because I was still wondering all that summer, am I going to, what is this, I'm, what am I going to do? And the thought of having the band was really starting to look good. And a friend told me about it, said, there's an opening. I remember calling him. I remember talking to him. He said, well, come on over. Are you, can you come tomorrow? This was late August. School started in those days, the 1st of September. Right, right after Labor Day. Um, I drove over to yeah. Folkestone. I don't know that I've ever been to Folkestone. Had a wonderful interview. Remember it well. He showed me around. I felt good in the school. Turned out, I don't believe there's a town in the United States that better suited me than folks <laughs> in Georgia. I sometimes think, what would you do different? Well, everything. <laughs> if I live my life, everything except I might want to start my teaching career. The people were wonderful. I have I don't mean casual friends. I have very dear friends today who I met in that town. I learned um, that was the job for me and was only there a couple of years. And um, What changed? How did you change from there? Well, once again, some the band developed nicely. Right. The band director preceding me had had some some health problems and had to leave early. So when I got there, the the band from January through May had not existed. So we had to start over. And, the, and there were so many wonderful, now you think of a tiny, I don't know what the population was, but it was a small school in a small town. The, the amount of talent in that town was amazing. And, I, and I'm careful choice of words, the t talent was amazing. Several people went on to professional careers in music. Interestingly enough, that band today is one of the best bands in in the district. Wow! And um, the um, it's it's still a very fine music. small town. They value their school. Then why in the heck did you leave that? Uh, what called you away? Well, <laughs> one thing I had a girlfriend oh. that it was a long drive, <laughs> and I could move to a town where she lived, and I did, and we we married during that that time too but i somebody actually offered me they came to see me and offered you got recruited i got recruited did you care at that point in time about where you were you know i mean you grew up in valdosta you went to school in valdosta you had all this history in one place where and you, came back to valdosta to the, to the junior high school but when you were initially when you were going there was a job and you went but then you got called to another place were there any decision points there no, or you just went no and then after th three years i went i took a full, full year off and went to the university of georgia for a master's and um at that point um a real fine band director in the atlanta metro area who became the music supervisor in cobb county knew me from having judged my bands at charlton county and valdosta and he called me and said we've got two openings in Cobb County. I'd like for you to look at them. I went and looked at both of them. Um, I took one and I wanted to be in Cobb because I wanted to work with this music supervisor. He had been a wonderful high school band director and he was a great music supervisor too. Board McCowan uh, just passed away a couple of years ago. Well, I was set probably forever at that high school. That high school, that job fit me as well as the the uh, folks in job, the, the Campbell High School in Smyrna. Once again, wonderful band program, wonderful people, great school, the good administrative staff. But I was teaching at the Governor's Honors Program in, in Macon late, well, it wasn't too late summer, but it was, I had already started my rehearsals at Campbell High School, and I got a call from Valdosta State, and they said, um, tell you how that happened i'm telling i'm telling the world and i've not even told many people this but we took a tour with our uh, campbell band down to i think disney and and we played i knew the band director here 
and I called a very good friend, and I said, can you set us up a concert and we spend the night? So we played a concert here, and um, a faculty member called me, and I know it was, he never said, I know it was based on that concert, and said, we, we have an opening. Are you willing to come and um, um, do the job here? At the college? Yeah. And my wife, wonderful wife, had gotten real um, co comfortable living in Atlanta. It was first time being away, and she liked Smyrna, and she liked being close to Atlanta. And I drove home, I think, that afternoon from Macon. And we had to go on this honors program in Macon. I said, um, I've got a call to go interview at Valdosta State. Boy, I could, uh, that was one of the um, <laughs> kind of a sad moment I could tell. It was, okay, great, let's, let's get ready to go. She really? You really want to do that? I so, said, she, I, so she was outwardly supportive. She did not want to leave Atlanta. Okay. She did not want to. I did not want to leave Atlanta either, but I wanted very much. The college, the college job suited what I liked to do, and it was a program, I think, that was really ready to start growing. It was just ready at that time. So we, we talked about it. I came and interviewed, and um, she, she had a tough time with the move, yeah. um, but came back. And now she's glad we did. I'm sure. glad we did. And um, it was it was tough to, for a little while, but um, it was a good move. So so this is the this is the question. Um, you had an opportunity. You you waited. You were very happy where you were. She was very happy where you were. What tipped it? What what was the thing that the two of you could agree on, whether there was a price to pay or not, that this was a good decision? For both of you. The potential for personal development, advancement, opportunity was greater, even in a small university than in a high school. Got it. And there's a there's a certain attitude that goes with teaching and um, on the university level that you don't have on the high school level. Now, for a couple of years, the band that I had at Smyrna was better than the college band, and sure. just no question about it, it was better. It was a small department starting to grow, and it grew quickly and, and into a very, very fine department. But I thought many times, those first couple of years, I, I left a, a band with a perfect instrumentation to a band with a very sparse instrumentation. And I'm many times on the podium thinking, boy, did, did, I, did I make a mistake? This is not a lot of fun. And it was tough the first couple of years. Well, but what happened was you you were in a place where you had a comfort zone. You know, you were comfortable where you were. And as you said yourself, you could have run that out. That could have been your yeah, career. Absolutely. So, so you had to pay a price to make that shift. And that price had to be paid for a while to build back up. You had, had to kind of restart and build that muscle back up. Uh, so... Um, when did you feel like okay? I'm glad we did this. How long did that take, Steve? It was um, it was well. It was beyond three years. Wow! All during that time, I don't think I was sorry that I took the job. Right. But I I I thought many times I didn't think it was going to be this hard, this challenging. Um, and I would think of the man I left, and um. I was invited to guest conduct the band that had been mine at the state convention and going from my small college band into a very large, fine high school band and thinking, gosh, they play a lot better. <laughs> it was it was tough. Yeah. But as I said, we were drawing good students at the time. And it, it took about three years till I had a band that I was very proud of and um, thought that it was playing on the college level. Okay. So you, you've built, you've, you've gone through a series of changes. You're now at Valdosta, took you three years to develop something. Now you've got it at a place. Was that, what was the next bend in the road that you had to face? What was the next thing that, that sort of was a change of that career? 
Were you were you gigging at the time? Were you building? I've always played gigs. As I said, my my high school band director would invite me to play, and um, he was a tenor sax player, and I played trumpet. And we would play at Moody Air Force Base. We'd go over to the Marine Base in Albany, and um, there were two base two bases we played in, or two places. I don't know if they were two air two. There was a Marine Base and some um, somewhere else. We played a lot in Albany. And I knew I liked that aspect of music too. I liked having to to produce. You you, you can sometimes you can hide behind others, but when you're in a six piece band and you're on a stage, you have to do your part. Yeah. And you communicate with those other five. And I liked that. And I I was proud that my band director would take me with him. Yeah. On a gig. So I've always and and. I, I didn't tell you earlier, in high school, I put together, I guess it was a, let me see, a sax and a trumpet and a trombone with three and a piano, bass, and drum. We had six. I put together a little band in high school, and and there was a company in New York called Terminal Music that you could buy arrangements from. I didn't have a checkbook or any money, and I asked my mother to um, buy some music for me. Wouldn't go to my daddy because I knew he wouldn't. He wouldn't have done it. <laughs> How much is that music, son? Well, it's ninety cents per round. Ninety cents. <laughs> so I told mother I needed about ten pieces of music if we were gonna have a band. She's so she bought some music for me. It, it really it was ninety cents an arrangement. And uh, I can tell you, tell you every person that personnel in, in the band. Matter of fact, looking on the wall over there, that tuba player in the middle of the trio right there, that's Sammy Allen. We didn't have a bass. I had a tuba instead of a bass in my dance band. And we played these arrangements. Our theme song was Love Walked In. Now, I'd never known that song before, but the reason it was the theme song, because it was the easiest arrangement. And it sounded really, really good when we played it. So that became our theme song. Well, we, this was my sophomore year. I booked the high school Christmas dance, mm. which was held at the junior high. It was first, my first professional job. And um, we played it. And I remember, I remember, say, I was, I was sitting up there next to a trombone player and a saxophone, Tommy Kunkel, the saxophone player, and I saw the band director walking to me. And he, he I idolized him. I thought, what's he gonna what's he gonna say? And he kinda he said, um, tell Sammy to play those notes a little shorter. He was the bass player. And he was playing the tuba like he would have <laughs> instead of a string bass. Right. And I thought, Oh boy, that's great. That was the only thing he was gonna tell me. Well, well, it was a tip. He was trying to help you along. Absolutely. It wasn't a criticism. It was a, hey, this will help you out. Yeah. Yeah. And we made, we made $20 a piece. Wow. And it would take me all day Saturday mowing lawns to make $20, if I can make that much. And I thought, man, this is an easy decision. Yeah. One of my, you know, uh, we, we have a breakfast group on Fridays and, uh, uh, Everybody in there is a band director except me and a couple others. Uh, but one of the others is a is another fan of Robert Heinlein. Robert Heinlein is one of the deans of science fiction. Uh, but one of the things that Heinlein was in the in the Navy and he got tuberculosis and they washed him out and he's trying to figure out how we're going to make a living. And there was a contest for um, a short story contest, fifty dollars, and he won it. And he said, "I never I never worked an honest day in my life." After that, and so it sounds like you had a very similar experience. Well, that that was an important part of it—the fact that I got paid to do what is as much fun as, and it was fun to pay the other guys. Yeah. I enjoyed handing them that money. Uh, yeah, it yeah. was fun. Yeah, I still enjoy it today. Um, so uh, let's get back to the question of you're in the flow. You've got the, the schools kind of straightened out now. You got a good band. What was the next major crossroad that you came to? It wasn't all the way out at retirement, well, was it? Well, uh, it, was, it was major capital and underscored. It was major. Um, we decided to add football at the university. Mm. And I was in many meetings with the president. It was Dr. Hugh Bailey at the time and others and department head of music and the director of the division. And it kind of fell my lot to see all that this was going to happen. Well, marching band is not a strength of mine. Mm -hmm. it, it, 
It never, I didn't march in a college band. Um, I could have marched some at University of Georgia. Matter of fact, they asked me to, but I, I was too busy. I was studying composition and graduate work. I just couldn't do it. Right. And I didn't think I could do the job. And so I just told the dean, I just don't think I can do this. It's not, I didn't want to do it, hmm. but I didn't think I could do it. Got it. And I didn't think it was going to change my direction as much as it, as it did. Looking back, I would have been a better controller of my fate had I done it and, and, and said, well, I'm going to do it. But I didn't want to do it. Right. And I moved into um, other areas, didn't leave the instrumental department, but was no longer in charge of the band program as I had been, worked the concert band for a while. And then... I also did the jazz man, and I did it back and forth the whole time I was there. I actually hired someone in the in that um, a real fine teacher to come in and work with the jazz man, and I took the other band, and then we had the marching band. Well, to hire another position meant that he was pretty well going to do the band. So for a couple of years, I didn't do any instrumental music, and then worked back into it. So that that was the uh, that was the the moment, the event, the circumstance that was um, that caused a lot of change at the time. Now, as a teacher and as a conductor, you worked with a lot of young people who had talent, um, and some of those wanted to go pro with that, and others might have wanted to but didn't have mm-hmm. jobs. Certainly, um, did they come to you for counsel? How did you how did you work with them, and how did you help them pick a direction? <sighs> We, I, I think about that school, and at the time, I think when I started, there were maybe four instrumental majors. There were over 100 within a few years. That's how quickly it grew. Wow. And we had some amazing talent, and we knew, we could tell when a student had the ability to go on. Most of the times, the student knows if they do or not. Occasionally, and I, I think this may be what your interest is, occasionally we would have a student who wanted to, and we knew that it was not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And we did, I, I'm not, I can't discourage students. I just want to tell them, get out there and do your best. And, and maybe I should have told a couple of times, look, there's other things you can do in music, but being in a flute player in a symphony is probably not going to happen. I, I had a hard time doing that um, with students. But we, there are many professional players today who came through our program, and we watched them develop, and we generally knew who had that level of talent. Right. And, and we've had, um, we've got a number who went on and got doctorates in performance and uh, are teaching on the college level. So, you know, I've worked with young people from middle school through high school and into college and then adult theater as well. And many times I've had situations where we had somebody who had a passion and they really wanted to do things, but they really didn't have much in the way of talent. And it was they, they were attracted to the flash, but they didn't have the gravitas in the center and the and the you know. And I never discouraged them, but I I did say, You're gonna have to pay a price. Everybody's got to pay a price. And, but if you don't try it, you'll, that you'll, you'll pay that price all the time. You'll be looking back wondering what if. I think it's better to try a thing, realize that that might not be your gift, but it was pointing to something that you see when you get on that path. Um, I'll, you know, I may be Pollyanna to think that way, but uh, I mean, I've, I've had some kids that shouldn't be allowed to buy tickets to theater, let alone be on stage. But, uh, <laughs> But they had enthusiasm, and I don't want to dampen anybody's enthusiasm. Go out, try. I, I, I do the same as you do. I encourage you to try and pay the price and try to meet the standard and and see what you learn from that. Mm-hmm. You know, it may shine a light on on what you uh, where we, you should be going. We had a couple of few students who I thought had the talent to be performers and make it as an instrumentalist, but decided to go in education. And sometimes they were not the best band directors and they were wonderful players, but 
but they took the security. Right. There, there is a security to a, a teaching job and having state retirement, state insurance, and a nice schedule. And sure. you can frequently have a wife who has a similar schedule. There are a lot of advantages. But I saw some people who could um, who could have been performers that chose that lifestyle. And, um, and you know, you can't really fault them. For no, that. If that's absolutely. what you want, that's the thing to do. But don't sit around and whine that I could have been. You know, mm-hmm. if you could have been, go out and do it. Mm-hmm. I could have moved to Los Angeles as a as a trumpet player, and I would have been really hungry because I couldn't have made it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, me. My friend, um, Ed Barr, uh, I have enjoyed dancing to the music of his his orchestra. Uh, He's got how many different combinations? you got the big band for once a year. Well, we... 17, 18, maybe 20? Yeah, 20, sometimes we use 22. I'm playing with my five piece this week, as a matter of fact, at uh, the country club. We have a, a, a dance Thursday night. I, I guess we don't have time, but the big band is something maybe we can do another podcast. I love, to, I love big band. I grew up listening to big band music. To have a big band is a, is a, a challenge beyond what you can, can imagine. It's just, it's like trying to do something that, Almost shouldn't be done. Right. But it's that much fun or I wouldn't keep doing it. I love to well, play big band music. I'll, I'll take you up on that. If you, if you uh, think we've got the, the, uh, the copy, let's, let's set a date uh, when we get off of here and bring you back and let's talk only big band. At that point right, I'm for it. Yeah, sounds fun. Uh, for the Crossroad Diner, for my friend Ed Barr, thanks for being with us and we'll see you next time. We talk to people from all walks of life about their journey and their decisions at their crossroads. If you are one of those people or you know someone that you'd like to recommend to us, let us know at Crossroad Diner at StorymasterMedia.com. And we'll see you next week with another story from the Crossroad Diner.